Good afternoon, everyone. A very, very warm welcome to the National Gallery Singapore, and thank you very much for joining us for the sixth Liu Kang Annual Lecture. And for this lecture, um, the title is Multi Cosmological Modernity in 1930s Penang by Dr. Simon Soon. It is a delight to see so many of you today. Well, we had, of course, our presidential election just yesterday, so really, really nice to see everyone coming down for art today. The Liu Kang Annual Lecture was first introduced in 2017 as a signature program by the gallery to acknowledge the significant impact of Liu Kang, Liu Kang's life and practice had on many aspects of Singapore's art history. Through the last five editions of this public lecture series, we have been privileged to feature a multitude of distinguished speakers whose research focuses on Singapore's art history. These lectures are planned in partnership with the Liu Kang family. We would like to extend our gratitude for their unwavering support in supporting emerging scholarship on art in Singapore and the region. This year, our sixth edition, we are very honoured to have Dr. Simon Soon, currently the Deputy, Deputy Dean of Postgraduate Studies and Senior Lecturer at the Faculty of Creative Arts, University, Malaya. Dr. Soon's reading and research interests span from comparative modernities to art historiography, with a focus on 20th century art in Southeast Asia. His thesis, What is Left of Art, investigated the intersection of left-leaning political art movements and modern urban formations in Indonesia and Singapore, Thailand and the Philippines from the 1950s to the 1970s. Soon is co-editor of Narratives of Malaysian Art, Volume 4, as well as editorial advisor to Southeast of Now, Directions in Contemporary and Modern Art, a peer-reviewed journal. He also has an interest in Historical Geographical Information System, or GIS, and the creative use of digital tools in the humanities, which you will learn more about in his lecture today. So I'm also really excited. Without any further delay, please join me in welcoming Dr. Simon Soon. Simon, please. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Seng Eugene, for the very kind introduction. And thank you to the National Gallery of Singapore for inviting me to um, share with you uh, my research. I'm indebted to Jaying and Erika for their constant encouragement. And I'm very honored to be speaking to all of you, more so because I've learned so much from the scholarship that many of you have undertaken here in Singapore, and I continue to rely on many digital resources made available by Singapore institutions for the research that I embark on Penang's modern art history, modern art and cultural history. I also like to acknowledge uh, Yoman Tong Lao Su and Michael and Shaniza Hoffman, uh, Michael Yong and Shaniza Hoffman for the many conversations during my early research on Yong Man Sen, which will also be shared here today. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge the Getty Foundation's Connecting Art History Site and Space project, which provided me with my first scholarly foray into Penang, a site and space that has over time taken a digital turn in response to my exploration of digital humanities tools during the pandemic. So creating historical and cultural data sets for any form of computational expression or visualization is the principal creative challenge for all researchers of history and culture uh, face in realizing a digital uh, humanities project. What one can build is contingent on what one can find. And it was in perusing numerous digitized Penang and Singapore newspapers made available by the National Library of Singapore and the NUS Digital Gems collection that I chanced upon a series of reporting that piqued my interest. From 1934 to 1936, a Penang correspondent for the Nanyang Sangpao, uh, who wrote under the byline Nan Kuo, 
published a series of articles that provided an overview of Chinese businesses and trades in Penang. Writing in the aftermath of the Great Depression, uh, uh, it, which was a catastrophic global financial meltdown, Nan Kuo's writing sought to capture the social and cultural foments in its way. Despite having no training in the social sciences, uh, Nan Kuo adopted social scientific methods in his reporting, uh, in his weekly columns. More than simply reporting on local news and affairs, he surveyed empty houses, counted number of bicycle shops, observed peculiar habits of Penang residents, spoke to Penang residents from a variety of class backgrounds, and even visited art exhibitions. Nan Kuo, for me, is a fascinating figure because through his data-rich yet reflexive writing, we sense that aesthetic played a larger role in shaping the nuances of one's imagination of their place in the world in the world during the early 20th century. So my interest was to see if I can work with this textual data using historical GIS uh, in a mapping exercise to explore these articles alongside the paintings and activities of Penang's two modern artists, Abdullah Arif and Yong Man Sin. In the research, I hope to adopt what James Baker calls a soft form of digital humanities uh, where the visualization didn't end up as the sort of like final product, but nonetheless, it's something that uh, we used to sort of like, you know, uh, build my research on, okay? So studio space, street life, exhibition venues. Uh, here, I will try to reconstruct them to bring into relief the dynamic cultural landscape of 1930s Penang. Uh, and I like to entertain the idea that Penang's modernity and finally, uh, what i like to entertain uh, at the conclusion is the idea of Penang's modernity through the lens of animism, perhaps to bring into relief the island's city's multi-cosmological uh, society. Scholars in Southeast Asia have aimed to understand the interactive features within Southeast Asia's plural landscape in a move to complicate Fernafal's idea of plural society, where the market domain serves as a zone of contact for a limited form of intercultural interaction. In the context of the Dutch East Indies, um, anthropologist James Siegel, for example, notes that overhearing across communities allow for a diverse forms, diverse communities of, colon, of the colonized to speak back to the colonizer, occurring in the ambivalence afforded by the unified lang Malay language register. While on early 20th century Penang, the historian Sulin Lewis suggests that the unifying language for cross-cultural debate took place in the English language through newspapers like The Straits Echo. But what I hope to ask here is whether we can overhear across linguistic divide and whether we need a unifying language to do for overhearing to occur. How was the plural geography imagined by the immigrant communities of Penang? Some clues can be gleaned from the multiplicity of street names. And the title of today's talk takes on the quality of this translational proximity where each linguistic domain conserves its own distinct meaning from one another while also overhearing one another. Due to the organization of streets by ethnicity, architecture historian for, uh, Anoma Paris, for example, notes that Georgetown had an abundance of streets that were associated with ethnic communities, places of origins or countries of birth, common to both Singapore and Penang. The distinction between street and place is also noteworthy here, alerting us to the manner in which the grid had cut through broader, broader systems of physical and social belonging and impose urban values on rural associations. But unlike Singapore, where colonial categories, according to Paris, threatened to homogenize ethnic groups, immigrant and immigrant communities were evasive and refused to acknowledge municipal names, Georgetown gathered multiple geographies and their connected ethnic identities into its street system. Consequently, Kampong and Street Tukon exaggerate the importance in the, for the city's inhabitants delineating even the most minor ethnicities and dialect group here. So whereas natives of Malacca uh, produce hybrid rural enclaves and natives in Singapore produce alternative forms of pluralism, both define the colonial urban plan 
for Paris, Georgetown's competing migrant communities claim their new geography as integral to their effort at self-determination. Can we therefore perhaps think of overhearing without necessarily meaning that ideas are translated and understood across communal or linguistic divide? If so, how might mapping out Penang's 1930s um, cultural landscape through a particular linguistic record uh, allow us to understand this? The focus then is on two emergent communities, that of the Chinese and the Malay, as new nationalistic registers that were in formation in the early 20th century in British Malaya. Okay. The Chinese newspaper then played a significant role in the 1920s and 30s to promote this reformation of culture. News reports on art historical activities, both locally and in China, as well as featured cultural writings, uh, began to be highlighted in the papers itself, as can be seen by this 1922 report in the Penang Simple, which states that Georgetown and Penang already had a population of 10,000. Uh, now there are many Shanghai art school graduates, and that an art school, this was a call for the establishment of an art school in 1922 in Penang that can contribute to our cultural and civilizational progress. Uh, the founders included a list of 15 businessmen and cultural patrons, including Ling Sheng Hui, Chan Pei Chi, and Ao Bun Pao. Um, so these were, of course, very much contemporaneous with artistic efforts and activities that were found in Singapore. Similarly, art history, art history as a nascent field that contributed to the development of modern art was also avidly reported in newspapers in the Straits Settlement, such as Su Pei Hong's 1926 lecture on the origin of arts and its purpose, can be found in the Nanya Sampao, as well as, um, you know, uh, which we can compare to reports that indicated attention by local Chinese researchers was also turned towards the region. Uh, such as this 1924 report on research initiative to document the theatrical arts of Java. In many ways, Penang was part of this larger acumenae, which had its hub centered in Singapore. Yet being away from Singapore suggests that Georgetown developed a distinct tenor. If Anoma Paris have highlighted how urban <laughs> morphology of Georgetown has acquired its own unique organizational pattern by the 19th century, here I'd like to direct our attention to the spatial characteristics of 1930s Georgetown that can be understood through Chinese newspapers of that period. Because it is, uh, for me, what's interesting is it is a resource that is rich enough for us to begin to map out a non-English language perspective of, um, you know, the city's cultural urbanscape. And I want to suggest that in looking at non-English sources, we might want to pay attention to also how these materials might begin to open us, uh, open us up to thinking about divergent imagination rather than limit our containers to the study of a singular, singular cultural domain. One, writing in the aftermath of the Great Depression, Penang correspondent, Nan Kuo published a series of articles that provided an overview of Chinese businesses in Penang. Some of the articles he wrote included statistical surveys of various kinds of street uh, sectors that the Chinese community had a majority stake in. Nan Kuo's writing, Nan Kuo's writing sought to capture the social and cultural foreman of that time. In part, he would recognize a lesson in cultural resilience can be gained by looking at how Penang's mercantile enterprises weathered through this crisis. Despite having no training in the social sciences, uh, the only uh, uh, you know, very personal record uh, uh, of uh, Nan Kuo reflecting on his methodology was found in a New Year as, uh, an essay he wrote during the New Year, where he uh, gave us a sense that the only reason why he was writing this was because he was friends with the editor of Nanyang Xiangpao, and he was uh, very much um, encouraged to do so. But his aspiration was to capture the bigger picture of a city that was slowly getting back on its two feet after a long spell of recession. But more than uh, so, this was uh, particularly interested, uh, interesting for him. Right? Um, so in his regular columns, he would report on going on of Penang on the one hand, while also producing longer investigative features on topics that he felt was important to think alongside his reader touching on trade, nationalism, challenges of modern life, and women's fight for equality, to name a few. 
the art gallery and visiting art museum uh, art exhibitions was also uh, one of uh, the things that he covered extensively. Nan Kuo's investigation therefore encompassed different areas of cultural life in Penang. An example can be seen in his exploration of Beach Street's cultural geography. Here he introduced the different sections of Beach Street as reflected in the different Chinese street names given to an otherwise long stretch of road called Beach Street. As Penang's historical significant commercial thoroughfare, the street was beginning, was beginning to lose its commercial prominence by the 1930s. Having attracted people from all corners of the world, Penang therefore, was therefore a babel, babel. Nothing reflects this better than the street names of the port city. The streets known by different names in different languages often reflect the language, communities, historical engagement in a particular area in Penang. So here, for example, in Nine Kuo's um, investigation, we could map out, for example, where the Kopitiam was located as a significant institution in Penang's history during the 1930s, serving as a crossroad and a public sphere where gossips are traded and where bodies are also sort of like nourished, characterized by this casual, boisterous and lively, uh, lively atmosphere. This Kopitiam, along all these sort of like stretch of road, caters as a place of rest, food and conversation to the townspeople coming from all walks of life. Uh, a number of Wokwanko's writings reflected his sensitivity to the city's many layered sights and sounds, uh, including uh, the listing of hotels and hostels on their locations, uh, the two main forms of housing that accommodated Penang's transient population of travelers. From his article, we learned that the temporary lodgings can be divided into two types. Hotels come in a range of service that cater to a growing leisure class of tourists, but hostels then are uh, temporary resting place for workers uh, who were making their way into remote parts of the Malay Peninsula to work either in the plantation or the mines. Um, so these were things that were sort of like discussed uh, in his article as well. Uh, other examples of the trade, including, for example, the tailoring trade. And another example includes like, uh, for example, the various barbers and hairdressers of Penang with the concentration of premium Japanese and European barbers and hairdressers along the Deep Street and uh, West Campbell Street corridor, represented by the green color section and the middle tier hairdressers along Campbell Street in the yellow section, followed by the street side barbers costing only one cent, located in the red sections of Georgetown. Uh, here, then, other than focusing on trade, this is where it becomes interesting. He also wrote on a wide uh, variety of entertainment available to a person living in Penang during the mid-30s. By turn, exurbic and comical, he often carry catches various pastimes and vices that Penang residents of different social classes were fond of engaging. Uh, and in doing so, this cap he captures some of the city's comedy of manners found in its bookshop businesses, printers, photo studios, theaters, and cinemas uh, that were uh, covered in sort of like successive columns uh, during, uh, over, the, over his, um, the period where he was publishing about uh, and reporting on Penang. For example, the Chinese book businesses were initially located on a specific part of the Penang's commercial thoroughfare on Beach Street known as Gang Tai Ko in Chinese. The term translates as harbor entrance and refers to the section of Beach Street between two pen perpendicular streets, China Street and Julia Street. Gradually, the number of bookshops increased and the businesses opened further down Beach Street between Julia and Armenian. This section was known as the Central Street in Chinese. But by the 30s, um, Nan Kuo noted that the boot trade wasn't an easy business to sustain. So early bookshops came and went, went frequently. And because of the recession, the book business then shifted away from Beach Street towards an area known as uh, Ta Tian Zai, or Swamp Fields in Chinese, which refers to the section of Carnarvon Street that is south of Achin Street. Uh, so this documentation suggests to us, uh, when you go to Penang today, some of the older bookstores are now located in the Carnarvon Street area. And doc, uh, Nan document, documentation suggests that this shift happened over the course of the 1930s. 
what has been largely forgotten is that this book uh, trade did not just take the form of a bookshop, a shop business. Booksellers, without the capital outlay to afford shop rental, also took to the streets, setting up bookstalls along Rope Walk, Kimberley Street, and Carnarvon Street, as can be represented by the dotted uh, uh, orange line there. Naturally, he also featured the printing presses and the, the were in George and where they were located in Georgetown. And when we think of therefore the 1920s, uh, and, and then he also tried to sort of like look at the photo studio business as well. In the 1920s, much like Singapore, Chinese photo studios dominated the trade. And then technological advancement had made it difficult for European photographers to maintain their service in services and providing luxury goods. They were gradually being replaced by Japanese photograph photographers and very select number of Chinese photo studios then began to fulfill that role. Most other Chinese photographic business, on the other hand, catered to the growing masses who were increasingly regarded, who, uh, who uh, then made it sort of like much more affordable. Um, these photo studios were usually family run and this brought down the prices of the photographic portrait taken. Uh, in the 1920s, uh, before the Great Depression, this was the number of studios that um, uh, uh, Nankuo was able to sort of like map out uh, during that period in time. But after the sort of financial crisis, Nankuo surveyed the photo studios of Penang and revealed a much more shrunken and also distributed industry. Um, and this was a while this was a period of loss for many, small windows of opportunities opened for others. The Penang painter, a pioneering painter that we know as of Yong Man Sin and his family, uh, was one of the few that recognized the opportunity for them to enter into the photo studio business around this time, uh, where he then converted his art gallery into the photo studio. And more will be said about this later. So uh, other than that, uh, for example, I'll just give you one last example. Theatre venues were also places where Nankuo surveyed uh, quite extensively, uh, including like the emergence of two amusement parks uh, located in the southern, uh, southern part of Georgetown uh, that then slowly contributed to the decline of these standalone in institutions for luring away performers from theatre venues by offering them a larger audience in the newly emergent type of like talky films uh, that was that are beginning to take hold of Penang in the 1930s. And amongst the theatrical venues of the 1930s, there were also about five uh, that was dedicated to screening movies, but others then, uh, uh, what's interesting is that you get like a, a whole range of sort of like old and new theaters that was, uh, um, uh, there was, um, you know, uh, the, the sort of business was a very brisk. It sort of kept changing over the course of the 1930s. And therefore, um, you know, uh, uh, Nankuo's sort of like mapping, uh, he also dedicated sort of like two articles to look at both the old theatres and the new theatres and made the distinction of where they were located and how that all this information then contributed to giving us a sense of, you know, where the center of commercial activity and cultural activity was beginning to sort of like take shape in Georgetown during that period in time. It wouldn't be long before new visitors to Penang are introduced to the bustling commotion of Penang's lively street scene. And this is one interesting point, uh, an interesting sort of like dimension of uh, Nankwa's uh, documentation that I want to share with you here, where he documented the uh, hawker calls and hawking culture. Uh, very much similar to the work of Samuel Victor Constant, uh, uh, it's 1936 book, Call Sounds and Merchandise of Baking Street Peddlers, uh, contemporaneous with it at the same time as well. Hawkers sell all manners of wares, adding significant textures and colors to Penang street life and food culture. Nanko was so moved by the hawkers' enterprising hard work that in writing an article on Penang's hockey culture, he argued that their diligence formed the backbone of a community's cultural achievement and strength. In time, hawkers could be identified by the distinct sounds used for the advertising of their businesses, as you can see up here. 
the different types of instruments or tools that were used to advertise uh, whatever that was being sort of like traded, right? Uh, in a sense, what I like about this, uh, uh, you know, very descriptive um, list is that it captured a sense of the noisy, noise, the very noisy texture of a port city. So when overlaid, the noisiness of a port city then really comes to view, allowing us to see where the cultural activities of the cities are increasingly being concentrated at. It is here that we see a gradual shift away from the historical site of commerce centered along Beach Street, where historically that was where all the banks were located, uh, with then a new parallel road called Penang Road running parallel to Beach Street, uh, which you can see with that sort of like white line running down uh, Georgetown emerging as the new artery for commerce, entertainment, and leisure in early 20th century Georgetown. It is little wonder that by the 1930s, Yong Man Sen, who would have set up his studio at the western end of Chulia Street, would move his studio over to Penang Road. Diagonally across from his Penang studio, uh, he would also later set up a Shanghai, the Shanghai Photographic Studio. And these are some of the advertisements that can be found in newspaper that would date them uh, the, the, up to when the studio was sort of like established. Some of the earliest article uh, advertisements that I found of um, the studios that would securely date them to uh, when these studios were established at what particular location. Now, focusing on Mansen here as an enterprising artist within the milieu of Nankuo's trade country, opens to position Mansen not as an outlier, but as part of a landscape of cultural resilience in the wake of the global economic crisis. It also helps us to understand the cultural ecologies and social infrastructure in place that supported the beginning of an artistic sort of like community. Right? And this movement can be seen on several scale, also through uh, whatever historical records that we can find. Firstly, we will look at it from the perspective of Mansen's own business as painter and photographer. And then we will consider it from the scale of a community through reconstructing the 1936 Ying Ying Art Exhibition Society's um, exhibition. Finally, we will offer a counter perspective by exploring another seminal Penang based artist, Abdullah Arif, in the visual cultural domain during the same period. Now, a survey of newspapers, advertisements on the photo studio points to the existence of Shanghai Studio as early as 1930. And we know that from a 1927 advertisement of Mansen's uh, studio that the photography related services were not yet then offered. Therefore, I think we can reasonably assume that if Shanghai Studio were, to, were already open for business in 1930, that Munson's photographic studio venture might have started with the conversion of half of his two shop lot of Munson's studio into a photographic business sometime around 1929. And at that point, Munson's studio sold art supplies, offered frame making services, and also ran art classes. It is from this 1930 travelogue that we gain a peek into what an artist studio looked like in the early 20th century Penang. Given that the travelogue was published in 1930, it is reasonable to assume that the author visited Penang one or two years before. So 1928 is my, uh, my guess that he was able to witness how this studio was, uh, how the studio looked like. This page long description of Munson's studio in the travelogue paints a vivid picture of what lies inside it. The studio had oil paintings for sale. Every inch of the studio wall space was filled with his paintings. These paintings included all manners of local landscapes, including what was described as lively depictions of Malay kampong life. Amongst the smaller paintings hung on display, on the display wall, it's a larger painting occupying the central space of, a, of the lion and tiger genre. In addition, there were also Chinese style paintings for sale uh, and also he provided art supply, uh, the sale of art supplies. The travelogue further records that Munson began importing European art supplies to fulfill a local market demand. And the art studio was also a frame-making workshop with imported mirror frames from Italy and Shanghai. Finally, based on family interviews conducted by Michael Yong uh, and Shaniza Othman, we have also learned that Munson's wife, Lam Sek Fong, uh, 
is actually uh, the able businesswoman behind the enterprise. She oversaw sales and daily operations of the studio, and it was a business that reportedly brought in a handsome profit of $10,000 in 1930, uh, according to the travel log. Unlike many others whose fortunes took a drastic turn during the Great Depression, Munson and his family seem to have made a small fortune. It is during this period that the family bought a piece of farmland in Ai Itnam, uh, one of the more remote areas, uh, suburbs in Penang, which explained the recurrence of the Teklok Si Temple as one of Munson's favorite subjects to paint. And it was also this period that he was one of the, uh, he became a car owner as well. And beyond venturing into the business of running two photo studios, then Munson had a brief period working also as a photojournalist. And this is something that I came across really by happenstance. And in fact, he was given the opportunity to edit a pictorial supplement for the Zhongnan Chen Bao, Chuna Morning Daily. A pictorial supplement very much was a one of attempt, and no further additions ensued as the newspaper was also relatively short lived. Nevertheless, the pictorial supplement offers us a clue to the growing cultural ties between Mansen and the relatively young, new, modern art scene that was also emerging in Singapore, spearheaded by the light of Zhang Ruqi, a graduate of the Shanghai Art Academy who has uh, settled down in Singapore. And it is unknown if Man, by 1930, Mansen already know Zhang Ruqi personally. However, it is obvious from the editorial experiment, experimentation that Mansen was exploring in his pictorial supplement that the influence of Zhang Ruqi is undeniable, who was then also the editor of the pictorial supplement Ye Hui of uh, Le Bao, the oldest Chinese language newspaper in the Straits Settlement in Singapore. Both Ye Hui and Munson's pictorial supplement shared a similar type of layout, occupying four full pages in the spreadsheet newspaper format. It included short captions with photographic cutouts and laid out in a scrapbook format interspersed with editorial cartoons. While Ye Hui's content had a more political focus with photographs taken from various sources, Man Kao's sole edition of the pictorial supplement tended to publish photographs he took himself, often featuring sporting events organized by the Chinese language schools of Penang. And in turn, in turn Ye Hui's had a much more diverse pool of cartoonists to draw on, while Munson pretty much drew every single cartoon in the pictorial supplement himself. Uh, um, so therefore, in his short foray into photojournalism uh, and taking on the challenge of editing a editorial, a pictorial supplement, this suggests that his undertaking and interest in photography was not merely just commercial. Uh, moreover, his interest in photography was not solely as a tool to capture and document scenic encounter for the sole purpose of committing them into his painting. Rather, we might think of how painting and photography work to complement one another as mediums of expression for Munson, as evidenced by his <coughs> participation in numerous art photography competitions from 1936 onwards. Having gained some measure of financial stability through his art and photo studio business in the 30s. Uh, we see then gra a gradual increase of Munson's public profile in Penang. And by 1936, he was able to bring together artists in Penang to put together an art exhibition on a scale that Penang had never seen before. The Penang Ying Ying Art Exhibition, Ying Ying Yi Su Zan Lan Hui, was held at the Li Teck School, fifth branch, from 2nd to 4th April. Planning for the exhibition began in early January that year. And, uh, and this was a sort of like huge undertaking that saw artworks exhibited, including painting, photography, sculpture, calligraphy, calf reliefs, stamps, with a total of approximately 300 pieces on view. More than 40 artists participated in the exhibition, including artists from across Malaya. Uh, in Singapore, as well as China and Japan. And this exhibition of works was selected by Yong Man Sen and his then disciple Li Chen Yong, with Man Sen taking the lead role in installing the artworks with the closing meeting, with a lot of the meetings held at Shanghai Photo Studio. Uh, the event was also then graced by the Consular General of China, Wang Yan Kai, and his wife officiating the opening ceremony then. 
Uh, and it is from uh, this 1936 article published in the Kuala Lumpur newspaper that we get the most comprehensive description of the exhibition, allowing us to uh, allowing us to finally identify the exact location of the building that is currently still in existence on 19 Lee Street. The article, moreover, provided a description of how the artworks are installed, uh, not just in the way, uh, you know, the white banners were sort of like being used uh, to greet visitors, but also that there is a front yard, a front courtyard in a U-shaped formation called a Qian Ting, a central foyer, a Zhong Ting, and a Lo Shang. Uh, and this kind of like description then allows us to um, uh, identify where the building is, which is currently on 19 Leaf Street today in uh, what, is, uh, what is called, uh, the business now is uh, Georgetown Wine. And it used to be the fifth branch of the Lee Tech School. Uh, so, what did the exhibition actually look like inside? So we could, through the descriptive sort of like accounts here, piece together some idea. So on the ground floor, for example, uh, so this is uh, the thing that I sort of like uh, roughly sort of like reconstructed. So on the ground floor, for example, in, installed in the sort of like courtyard, you have the sculptures of Li Cheng Yong and Yong Man Sen. Uh, and on the walls were displayed, sort of like opposing walls were displayed relief carvings, craft pieces and oil paintings um, eh, to greet the visitors with a registration desk at the front. And then with the oil paintings sort of like galleries at the side, while the watercolors, Chinese calligraphy and pastel works were shown in the rooms in the back called the central, uh, central hallway. Okay, and then on the first floor, focus mostly on photography work. This is the classroom upstairs, used to display photographic works, uh, including works of Wu Zhongxian, uh, contrib who contributed most of the photographic pieces for the exhibition, exhibiting scenes from both China and Malaysia. And Malaya. So considering that Nan Kuo had previously followed the development of the organizing committee since uh, January, one could sense that Nan Kuo's note of relief in his report that the opening was finally successful, that it finally sort of came together. And, uh, and during this time, it was also a, a time for him to reflect uh, on the exhibition. Besides listing the names of artists as well as the type of artworks on display, he recalled the number of exhibitions that he attended in the previous 10 years, uh, as can be shown here. And then this enumeration could be seen as one of the first attempts to record a Penang art history. And from the table, we learned that Mansen had participated in a group exhibition in 1931, which showcased the artists from both Penang, which showcased artists from both Penang and Ipoh. And group exhibition suggests that the cultural milieu Mansen was part of was an extended network that stretched beyond the shores of Penang. Oh, sorry. Uh, therefore, it's no surprise that in 1936, when the Society of Chinese Artists of Singapore was formally established, Mansen was elected as the vice president of the society, a position he held until 1939. I think here we may then, uh, uh, this is uh, just a tabulation of the exhibitions that were recalled by Nan Guo as he visited the Ying Ying Art Exhibition uh, of, uh, in Penang's, the past 10 years of Penang history. Uh, as you can see, a number of exhibitions were sort of organized principally for fundraising purposes, for various fundraising purposes. Some of them uh, were forgotten. The reason for the fund, what, 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 they, what, the, what funds were raised, were, it was not remembered by the artists, but this was what I was able to put together from the information uh, published in the article. I think here we may then try to understand the two bodies of representation in Munson's body of work. In his photographic portraits, fussy ornamentation and props are often pared down, right? The photographic portrait shows a mid here shows a middle-aged woman standing against a backdrop made up of abstract graphical lines in curvaceous sort of like form. The portrait came to Comes, uh, in a way, it comes to embody a new type of sensibility, like the energetic logo that he designed for the remaining of his studio in the 1930s. Here, the portrait 
took on an Art Deco sensibility. And this sensibility becomes distinct when we consider an example of his painterly output, Mother and Child, which is, of course, in the Singapore's National Gallery collection. Here, Munchen was much more taken by the work of Gauguin, which he was acquainted principally through books. In a sense, Gauguin's primitivism was attractive to Munchen, the painter, uh, who began training his attention towards those who remain unrepresented by the restrictions and conventions of the photo studio portrait in the 1930s. Yet this sensibility had over time reproduced in Mansen a kind of distancing stereotype of the other, specifically in terms of how Mansen viewed the Malay subjects that he often sought to capture in his paintings at a distance. It is in this uh, juncture that perhaps we can look at and consider the life and illustrations of Abdullah Arif, who grew up in the Jawi Pranakan community of Georgetown, uh, and to, off, to find a cosmopolitan counterpoint to the more Chinese imagination of Georgetown. Abdullah Arif worked as an art teacher at the Anglo-Chinese school, and is primarily known as one of the two non-Europeans who was invited to join the Penang Impressionist Society sometime in 1932. Some of Abdullah Arif's oil on board have survived from the 1930s, included two depictions of landscape. But in addition to that, he was also known as an illustrator. He experimented with lino cut, contributing to the annual school magazine published by the Anglo-Chinese school. And he was also known as a graphic designer, creating a well-known tourism postcard in the Art Deco style that featured the Penang vernacular which ran from Aitam up to Penang Hill. Yet it is in the local papers, uh, the local Jawi papers, that Abdullah uh, Arif's illustration highlighted aspects of the Malay community that is seldom captured in Mansen's depiction of the community. Here in the pages of Suara Malaysia, we see a reading public information often centered around a reciter preaching and joking to a crowd of enraptured listeners not unlike uh, the description made and the observation made by Malay scholar Zabas uh, in his article published in the Journal of Malaya branch of the Royal Asiatic Society, where he described a prevalent reading culture within Malay society during that time that still prioritized the orality of an expanded reading public, uh, as uh, represented by the two illustrations here uh, showing uh, Metaphor showing the gathering of mothers and daughters, uh, as well as uh, joking. Right? In the twice weekly newspaper Dewasa, for example, Abdullah Arif moreover contributed to the mass head that combined the floral decorative feature, bookended by a laborer hammering on an anvil to the left, and a bookish scholar sitting and absorbed in his reading on the right. The hourglass features prominently at the center of the masthead, connecting the title of the publication, Dewasa, which translates as adulthood or maturity, with the even broader idea of living in an age in motion, or a zaman peredaan, where time is of the essence and it is ticking. In the same issue, the world that the Jawi Pranakan or Malay community of Binang began orientate, orientating itself towards a different West, a West that had Islam at its center. In the illustrated vignettes of a column focusing on news from the Islamic world, the art historian Zakaria Ali pointed out that the juxtapositioning allowed Abdullah Arif to visualize and reconcile two distinct worlds, an Islamic world of palm trees, rows of domes, Giza pyramid, and Turkish march, and backdrop by a night sky filled with stars and crescent moon, and the ideas of modernity to see the world linked together by electrical communication, air and sea travels, working and living spaces, spreading horizontally and vertically. These are worlds that seemingly do not sort of like collide. They appear suspended in the pages of the print media pointing to many other trajectories of tradition and modernity that finds parallel in the cultural world that Nan Kuo and Man Sen were more familiar with. In turn, they remind us that perhaps a comparative lens might help us to see similarities as much as differences 
hinting at a culture of inaudible overhearing that are not necessarily mediated by often a shared language. Right? Uh, and maybe this mediation happens through visuality. So in concluding today's talk, I'd like to consider the closing words of Liu Kang's seminal 1960 essay, translated into English as Gravel of the River, Nurturing New Life. The context in which Liu Kang wrote the essay is vastly different from that of 1930s Penang. Yet I think that located in this plea is to recognize how we can situate artistic life and practice within a a broader social context. And this has pointed me to recognize context as something that is concretely infrastructural and ecological. Thus, in Liu Kang, when he points to how the developing an artist requires resources from a community at large, I cannot help but start thinking about what are the concretely infrastructural cultural ecology that shapes an artist or an artistic culture. Since the late 19th century, a Tauke-sponsored literati culture, of course, has flourished in the straight settlement. An example can be seen in the commemorations of, in, in commemorations such as the gallery of what is called Tsingshan of Golden Bodies, right? Sculptures commemorating prominent donors that were then, uh, they were deposited at the Keklok Si Temple then highest structure, then highest structure, Tower of Sacred Books that was completed in 1899. Compared with this Jingshan or this type of like sculptural convention or practice, commemorative sculptural convention or practice, Nan Kuo's exhaustive survey directed our attention away from this big man to explore cultural resilience in the wake of a global economic depression in the early 30s through a tabulation of small-scale businesses, entrepreneurship, and cultural activities that provided us with a sense of uh, the multi-cosmological societies that make up Georgetown as a cosmopolitan city then. In the absence of a Penang Chinese or Jawi Malay trade directory, I very much hope to stand corrected on this matter, uh, Nan Kuo's reporting is the beginning of a valuable and concrete statistical record that adds color and offers new, to, the numerical, uh, uh, to the numerical gaps in the colonial government reports that tended to, um, you know, uh, that, that has its own sort of like biases. More importantly, Nan Kuo's article shows us that interest in Quantitative data doesn't always have to be complete, and it's never comprehensive or complete. When supplemented by artistic and visual cultural materials from that period, in this case, we have brought into comparison Mansen, the Yong Mansen, and Abdullah Aris um, output. We are offered a glimpse into these many directional, multi cosmological realities of a port city rather than a simplistic reaffirmation of Fernimo's plural society. The prevailing debate amongst connoisseurs and collectors today, whether it was Mansen or Abdullah Arif, who truly deserved the appellation of father of modern Malaysian art, then therefore fades from our view. If we were to look to the 1930s, where one could sense the beginning of a cross-cultural Penang art community in formation, where both artists played a role, in giving shape to the plurality of Georgetown's visual culture. I like to consider briefly, then therefore, Guido Sprenger's reading of animism as a field of alterity concerning social relationships. Here, I think we may consider the multiple forms of alterity, like classes or, cent or centers and peripheries, as the context for the cultural differences engendered by such animism, which produces spirits, right? expanding, therefore, our understanding of spirit to mean guys. We may therefore think of the modern guys as relational plurality befitting a network cosmopolitanism in Penang. Mapping with its layering technique enables a form of noisy and art and cult a form of noisy art and cultural history to come into view. And this small sample is perhaps the beginning of a longer term project 
to excavate the noises of a crucially understudied period in Malaysian and perhaps also arguably Singaporean cultural history. Thank you. Simon, thanks for very um, thought-provoking and um, important research that, that you are doing. Um, before we open to the floor, I thought I'll just ask some easy questions for you first because I know the difficult questions are coming from the floor. So just to get you warmed up. Right. Sure, right? I'm in the hot seat. I know, I can see it in everybody's eyes. <laughs> right, so the easy question. Right? Um, I was actually counting the number of photo studios that were open before the Great Depression. I counted 22. It was a quick count. And after the Great Depression, it halved yeah, almost to about right. 11. And we can say that Munsen Studio was one of those that survived. It thrived, thrived. in spite of the photo, yeah, in spite of the Great Depression. I find that, I find that really fascinating. Um, can you tell us a bit about what made Munsen Studio different from the other um, photo studios in Penang? Mm. So, uh, well, this is primarily speculation because there's not a lot of like uh, materials to sort of like work on. My sense of why it thrives is because it piggybacked on already successful art studio business, art, art gallery business that it was running, right? As evidenced by the uh, Travelog account, which already reported that before the photo business studio sort of like took off, he was already, you know, making a profit of up to ten thousand dollars a year, which uh, I have not. I'm not an economist, but by all accounts, it sounds like that's a handsome. Uh, <laughs> that's quite a lot of yeah, money. Yeah, that's right? quite a lot $10, of money. Ten thousand dollars yeah, profit. Uh, it would allow him to sort of like buy land. He would be moving to a mansion along the sea face, uh, northern sea facing sort of like um, uh, uh, part of Penang. And, uh, and also, in many ways, expanded into the photographic studio business when other businesses were shrinking and collapsing. So looking at the Shanghai uh, photo studio, um, the, the size itself seems quite considerable. Um, when we think about, they were able to hold the um, Ying Ying Art Exhibition in 1936. That's the meeting uh, that where they had the organize, uh, the organizing committees meeting. Meeting, but there. not the exhibition not itself, the, yeah, okay. which was held on in a, a primary school, right? Right, just and around the corner. Yeah, uh -huh. the three hundred books. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, so I think, without further ado, maybe I should open to the floor. I do have some more questions, but um, I know that there are some difficult ones coming. Yeah. So I'll just open to the floor if anyone who has any questions. We've got the mics on the left and right. So just raise your hands and um, they'll come to you. Oh, we have a question? Yeah. Hi, uh, thank Hello. you so much for that very informative uh, lecture. Thank you. Uh, just looking at the map of Penang and uh, seeing that it has quite a long coast, uh, you know, and I was just wondering, were there influences that came from overseas, like uh, people who travelled uh, to Penang by boat, uh, that also has an impact on his art? Um, you know, especially when we look at, let's say, a comparison of Singapore with the low R8, and there's actually a very rich history of travellers who landed there in Teluk R8 uh, that has a great impact on the architecture of that area, mm -hmm. you know. So I'm just wondering if it was similar in the case of Penang. Right. Um, are you familiar with Penang or Georgetown? You've been a few times. I, I think you would got a sense that as a port city, the flavour, the, the tenor... The architecture is very much similar to S Singapore, right? As a sort of like port city that was really uh, originally a penal colony that then became, you know, a, a place where my different waves of migrant community then settled and made home. You would naturally have that kind of like diversity of uh, influences and yeah. So the challenge is then uh, maybe for architecture historians, they will look at buildings. Uh, and uh, in trying to, I guess, piece together maybe, uh, uh, trying to piece together 
what it was, what the art scene was like in the 1930s. Then one, I, I, I came to sort of like realize perhaps like one area which was rich enough for me to do that work was to look at the Chinese newspapers. I've tried doing it with the Jawi newspapers, but so far it hasn't been very successful because the records are not as comprehensive as the Chinese ones yet. Uh, but I'm still sort of like trying to find other avenues to see if I can then enrich my yeah uh, my understanding of that period. Now the, oh, we have a question from behind. Yeah, that gentleman. Sorry, I can't. Hello, hi. Uh, I'm interested to know when these artists were in Penang, do they station solely in Penang? Do they identify solely with Penang or what is their movement like within the context of South Asia? Do they frequent travel? Do they identify themselves as Penang citizen of some kind or, you know? Do they move around to Indonesia like for a few years and then move elsewhere? So, um, uh, I, 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 that, that's a that's a great question. I think um, the question of identity is not as concretized as uh, perhaps after the Second World War, where ideas of then nationalism began to take hold of the imagination of uh, you know the local demographic, right, in British Malaya and including Singapore at that time. So in the early twentieth century, you find like for example, uh, Yoman Sen, he was uh, born in uh, uh, Kuching, Sarawak. Uh, but was sent back to China to, uh, to have a bit of like, you know, a very rudimentary sort of like Confucian education, did some sort of like uh, 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 painting, uh, also sort of like learned some painting, but not extensively, and then eventually ended up in Singapore. Worked in a bookshop before heading up to Penang. Uh, and decided to then sort of like settle down there and started his business there. That's one example. So for Abdullah Arif, for example, I think his, his uh, you know, Jawi Pranakan, so he has Indian, Turkish, uh, Middle Eastern sort of like ancestry. So uh, alongside with the Malay, uh, you know, I, uh, ancestry. So I think their worldview is definitely sort of more cosmopolitan. Uh, and uh, during that time also, one of the things that, I guess you have to remember, I, in terms of identity, then it's you, know, you you can have you can be the subjects of you know two um, two different empires, right? You can you can slowly naturalize as you know a, a straight settlement sort of like subject, but at the same time you can also sti still uh, profess your Chinese sort of like identity. So like for Yong Man Sen, for example. Uh, when I don't know for Yong Man Sen, there's no sort of clear record. He never sort of like wrote in writing what he professed. But for someone like Nan Kuo, who wrote extensively in the newspaper, during that time, you would make a clear distinction. Zhu Guo is sort of like your ancestral country is China. But when you use the word Wo Guo, referring to cultural revival or resilience, then it becomes a bit more muddy. While it refers to, to I guess, the Chinese ecumene, it includes a much sort of like larger, uh, you know, territorial kind of like imagination where the Chinese communities have settled, including in the Nanyang. I, I hope that answers your question. And and actually, um, Simon, so this maybe seg segues to this question. So why why did you choose the term multi cosmological rather than say the term that you just mentioned, the cosmopolitan, right. for example. I think I was. Uh, I, I think I was trying to perhaps uh, in my uh, in my conclusion, I was trying to read it. I guess through the lens of animism, because I think a lot of this is also sustained by ideas of sort of like belief, right? And I was like reading of animism, maybe because we often think of this in terms of through the lens of ideology, through the lens of polit this, uh, political discourse, but I was trying to figure out if there's a way to 
yeah, think about sense of belonging through the lens of belief more than more than yeah the prevailing sort of like political discourse that was available then because as the work sort of like show um, they don't necessarily fit into that particular sort of like type of framing as well and uh, maybe that particular sort of like type of framing then creates a lot of different um, you know cultural silos right if you are doing research on say uh, Chinese artists during that time, then you look at Chinese materials and you only really sort of like focus on essentially the question of what it means to be Chinese at that time. But I wonder if we can sort of like look at non-English language sources and try to push for maybe a recognition that uh, that overhear, this term that I, I like from James Seeger, overhearing actually sort of like occurs in different language registers of that period as well. Thank you. Um, we have a question behind. Hi, hi. Simon, Eugene, it's uh, wonderful to be here. And, and thanks for adding uh, new perspectives uh, to this very unique period. My, my question is um, around um, your research practice, um, because uh, it's a um, long time ago. And I, I guess back then, in terms of the data and news uh, sources, um, it's, it's not so structured, right? So I can imagine, you know, kind of, you know, your research practice is almost like, you know, throwing darts and then seeing, you know, where you end up. But I'm also curious, you know, with um, the, you know, archival advances, uh, both in Malaysia as well as Singapore, you know, what sort of collaboration, you know, you know kind of um, practices, um, you know, or exercises that we can do together? Uh do to get well i mean I, I i have to profess that most of the all actually all of the resources that i've used come from singapore <laughs> and it was it came at a very opportune time during the pandemic right where we were all under lockdown and we had time to actually sort of like sift through uh the things the materials that were digitized both by uh, nus and the national library of singapore uh, uh the national library of singapore an LB, uh, National Library Board, Singapore, right? Uh, uh, but you're right. Um, in a way, a lot of the, oh, you know, you need time. You need to, uh, I felt like I invested a lot of time just digging out these materials, principally because uh, in searching through and combing through uh, Chinese language material, the OCR search function still is not, it doesn't sort of like capture everything that in a comprehensive sort of like manner. Therefore, you're still required to actually go through every single leaf of the newspaper, like how you would do in a microfiche sort of like system. La. So uh, that investment of time uh, needs to be there. Uh, but I hope like, you know, forums like this would and, uh, allow me to also sort of meet other Singapore scholars who are doing similar work here because the data is so much more richer in Singapore and there's so much more that's being done. The type of mapping that's being done is so much more sort of like comprehensive. The uh, trade directories are also much more, you know, well put together. Uh, I've not found any, you know, a lot of it, I, I, uh, a lot of my work is in conversation with what scholars have done here in Singapore. So what you find in Penang is that a lot of these materials are not there, so you have to sort of like figure out a way to work around some of these limitation in terms of like uh, uh, sources, right? Uh, just so happened there was this very peculiar figure who then sort of like tabulate his uh, data or sources in a very specific way, in a way of writing a column where he writes it out in the form of a column. And then that requires you to then do some, do requires me to sort of like do some translation work in making it. Uh, computer readable so that I can put it on the map. I, I do have one follow-on question uh -huh. on the um, archival part. I mean, we, we see a lot of, um, uh, I guess, enough paintings of um, Munson, but in terms of his photography practice, and, and you've explained, you know, kind of quite, quite a lot of, um, you know, the extent of his practice, so forth, uh, but we, we don't see these, you know, kind of negatives, these photo negatives. Uh, and I would imagine him having had, you know, a, a number of these photo studios. Um, 
that there should be more archival materials out there in terms of the negatives um, that that would you know kind of portray. You know, give us perspectives in terms of the times of the you know kind of the the multiculturalism, the mm-hmm. you know different ethnicities. I mean, you know, is is there something that you know we could do to um, research more in terms of the photography practice? Uh, yes, uh, definitely. Um, so, uh, so this is speaking uh, me speaking from a very sort of like limited perspective. We have found. Um, of course, it, uh, a number of his sort of uh, a number of his photographs. Uh, as far as I and you know, one of the things when you deal with photographic sort of like studio portraits is that they're quite conventional, right? Uh, they don't sort of like uh, they don't show a lot of sort of singularity. Uh, and they're quite sort of like uh, the same. Uh, but what we find is that, increase, uh, of course, in, for example, the National Archives would have a selection of it. Uh, they're also increasingly being excavated through the, uh, the sort of like antique flea market uh, by a particular collector in Malaysia. So uh, slowly we're piecing together at least a bit of a, uh, some volume so that we can start getting a sense of what are the emerging sort of like patterns uh, of that photographic studio, but his photographic studio practice. But uh, as far as I know, there is, uh, it, it's not so different from other photographic studios operating around at that time. Uh, the only interesting, like, so then maybe the question is about looking for perhaps how other people have then um, how other sort of like um, subjects in the 1930s or the 1950s have then interfaced with Mansen's photographic studio, right? So the work of, for example, artist uh, Hu Fan Chon, he's an artist who is based in Penang, who has been looking at um, how a pair of very good friends uh, who were transgender from the Eurasian sort of community went around in the 1950s to all the photo studios in Penang and started to sort of like take photos of themselves dressed up as girls. And of course, uh, Shanghai Photo Studio, as well as another studio that Mansen later opened up in the 1950s, cropped up in the, uh, in the venues that they were. They, they also visited like, during that time. So it's sort of like these micro stories that give you a sense that they do sort of like have an important role in shaping maybe other types of visual culture as people use the photo studio and, uh, for their own purposes and, uh, and, and had their own type of like, uh, contributing their own agency to how we can understand what the photo studios are being used for uh, over the course of, you know, the history of photo studios. Doing Thanks, that. Um, Thank you very much. Thanks, Michael, for your question. So we have two more questions. Um, so one's Roger and Ken Chow. Um, also, you also have a question, right? So we, you'll take the last question. Roger? Thank you. Um, thanks, Simon, for a really rich lecture. I'd like to take you back to the to the concept of overhearing, which you which you mentioned near the start of the lecture. I wonder if this is just a concept that describes relationships between communities in this historical period, or if this is also a concept that perhaps um, is guiding you in some way in terms of your methodology of looking at these materials. And as more materials become available to you, I wonder if you think you might approach a point of being able to speak about the relationship between artists, these artists, um, and the kind of rich sonic environment of the port city that you've sort of described for us. Um, are artists, um, you know, painters, photographers, and so on, are these uh, only just sort of a part of that sort of um, complex sonic, sonic kind of mess? Um, or are they also perhaps reflecting um, that context in their work in some ways? So thank you. Oh, that's a very uh, good point. I've not thought that far. I guess in any way, I, in, in this case at least, where I was, uh, the extent that I've sort of like thought about this issue that you have just raised was that I was, um, you know, when you often look at a Munson painting, it, uh, a painting from that period, it's often very quiet. Uh, right? uh, and I, I guess in... I, uh, in sort of like going through Nan Guo's sort of like description of how noisy the city was, it did sort of like spur me to think uh, in the direction that maybe we need to 
um, reflect on the relationship between sort of uh, sound space and how it's being sort of like visualized. Uh, but I'll take note on that point and really uh, that's something that will uh, that I have to sort of like look more carefully. Uh, and, uh, but that requires me to actually look at Mansin's painting, which is something that I haven't done. <laughs> <laughs> For your future research, um, um, Tian Chao, the mic's just behind you. Uh, thank you very much, Simon. Uh, this extends from the earlier question about you throwing ducks, uh, you know, in a much broader sphere of uh, interest and research uh, focuses. And also we just heard about even the sonic uh, playing an important uh, dimension, right? In this whole sphere of uh, uh, interest in visual culture and beyond in Penang. I was very struck by um, your showing of Man Singh's as well as Abdullah Arif's uh, uh, comparison between the paintings on the one hand and the graphics and photography on the other hand and that how the latter, the, you know, the graphics and photography could have linked to a lot more concerns in the broader sense uh, of you know, the society, the community, the world and so on uh, and the paintings appear to be maybe more uh, dated in time you know, such as referring to Gauguin uh, in the case of Man Singh's words. So I'm just thinking that, you know, uh, even uh, you use the, ter the term art scene as well as uh, the kind of focus that we have. We are doing this in the art museum here today. The continuing uh, centrality of art uh, as we look at, you know, uh, a larger scope of uh, social concerns as well as the noise, the port city of Penang and the kind of multiplicities of, you know, cultural uh, diversities and everything. Now, how do you as a researcher uh, uh, yourself feel that, you know, with this continuing focus on art, uh, both supported by institutions as well as, uh, you know, methodologies and so on, uh, really uh, will bring you further in what you are doing or are you thinking of approaching this in a different way whereby uh, continuing focus on art could be downplayed in order for us to gain a much broader picture of what exactly the artists uh, were doing in their context. Thank you, Ken Chow, for the question. Uh, let's see if I sort of, uh, I, I, I'm hoping that I will be able to answer it, uh, answer your question. Um, so you are, uh, understand your question um, correctly. So you are asking about whether. So it's a question of what I choose to sort of focus on. Is it? Yeah. Uh, if I have a priority in focusing on, you know, more cultural history in general versus the art. Uh, um, I guess. Uh, it, I mean, it goes back to perhaps the guiding question, right? Uh, you know, in the study of, say, Malaysian art history, or um, very often you hear that Munson is sort of like a pioneering figure. And there's no doubt that he had a very pioneering role. But my interest is sort of like trying to understand how we see sort of like pioneering. And uh, what was he, what was the world that? Uh, in which he was a pioneer of was like, right? And uh, and very often you would find that um, in trying to sort of like reconstruct the story of say a figure like Mansen, uh, a lot of the materials that was used to tell this story and this history came from after the war. Uh, no doubt, of course, the war has made assessing some of these uh, pre-war materials challenging and difficult and it wasn't until the digitization of uh, you know all this newspaper record enable us you know another avenue to sort of like um, piece together more accurately what were his activities like before the war period la? and then luckily enough it was extensive enough to help us to gain a better picture of what it was like during that time so my interest is uh, I guess then really sort of like okay if I have if I have an understanding of how Yingying Art Society exhibition look like 
in quite nitty gritty sort of like detail, including the layout of where the works were sort of like placed. If I have an understanding of how my, what was shown in Mansin Studio, Mansin's uh, art studio, as well as the uh, you know the type of like services that he was able to sort of like offer to his clients, then allowing him to actually sort of create quite a lively business, then what else was happening around there and why did he chose to then sort of like set up his studio say on Penang Road uh, and what was this sort of like cultural ecology that was helping to sustain his you know his enterprise during the 1930s I think that was something that I was trying to sort of like figure it out and Nan Kuo sort of like um, you know, writing came in at quite an opportune moment to help me to sort of like figure out what else was going on at that time because this would be maybe a world that he was familiar with. Yeah, thanks, um, Simon. I think that's an important point that you've reminded us today that artists are also entrepreneurial, you know, um, and, and they were involved in business and enterprises. And when you're involved in that, these connections extend beyond art, right, into other ecologies and economies, um, as well, whether is it economical or social uh, at the same time. So I think that's a really important reminder for us. And with that, um, please join me to thank Simon today. Thank you. For delivering such a wonderful lecture, uh, which is our sixth Liu Kang annual lecture. So thank you so much and have a great weekend ahead. Thank you.